Welcome, everyone. Uh, each time we do this, I, I realize how big a subject this is and how superficial I have to be in, in some regards. Uh, actually, couldn't fall asleep last night, and I thought of uh, uh, India and Pakistan, which we're not going to deal with. It's probably the biggest of all the Islamic things. But anyway, uh, just people are asking that that's a picture of the Hajj, the uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. And on the right, Islam is the solution to all the problem of creatures on the earth. Uh, question is, what's the problem if they have the solution? <laughs> Last time, we, we finished up two weeks about Jewish religion and the state. I just want to mention that this is a an ongoing issue. And some of the things we didn't deal with are a kind of change, this is in America, uh, the notion of Judaism as a civilization. And we're going to see that Islam, there are a lot of parallels with Islam uh, as a civilization, not, not just a religion, but it gets involved in politics, as we've seen. In the United States, uh, there's this uh, there's a, this International Council of Jewish Women promoting a just society based on human rights as Jewish values. That's a political statement. I mean, you know, you can uh, talk about various governments that way, and we're not going to do that. But that's, at least from my point of view, a positive statement. But you're going to have negative statements. There used to be an organization called uh, the American Council for Judaism, which was rapidly anti-Zionist until 1948, they gave up the ghost when the Israel was founded. And then on, on the bottom right, that's a picture I showed last time. It's in the West Bank of uh, Palestine, Israel. And these men are all religious. You can tell by their skull caps and their earlocks, but they're not in the peaceable kingdom, obviously, this is a very difficult situation, and there is a, a messianic notion involved in their uh, settlement. We talked about that last week. I just wanted to mention that before we move on to, uh, in this case, this is in the newspaper every day, so I thought I would throw it out before we go back in time for Islam. Israel, Hamas, and Gaza. Uh, that's a, a map of Israel, and uh, here's this Gaza Strip, this little note, this little area right here that is now in the midst of a terrible um, war. I posed the question, who are the Palestinians? Uh, what I want to point out, is this is not a religious question. It's not Islam. That We'll talk about that more, but it's these are competing nationalist movements. Uh, and I don't think that for a lot of people, religion is part of it, but it might be. Uh, but there's a question of Israel willing to share political authority, and Israel uses the Jewish identification as part of its self-identification. And we can ask how important Islam is Islam to Hamas, and we'll talk about that later because it is an outgrowth of an Islamic movement. And Hezbollah, as you may be familiar, that's from it's in Lebanon. Uh, they are both from different branches of Islam, and yet they're cooperating here because they both have an anti-Israel uh, outlook. Uh, and I just throw this out here just to note that uh, this is very contemporary. These are a lot of issues. We'll go back in time. Uh, and when we say, what is Israel's interest in Gaza? It's not a religious interest. It's what they consider uh, their security situation. So it's not as though it's anti-Islam. As a matter of fact, the Palestinians are up to 10% Christian. And we mentioned that last week. Um, but that isn't what you get out of the newspapers. But let's move on. Uh, and I don't think 
that religion is actively involved in this conflict, although there are exceptions to that when you talk about Jerusalem. You know, uh, that's a, that, is, that is a religious issue because uh, we'll see some more. But you probably are, these are things that are not new to you, I assume, but it's there. I would like to just mention this, and I thought of this last night. I threw this in the slide actually about half an hour ago. Certain international conflicts become co -celeb. If we look at India and Pakistan in 1947 and 48, some of the biggest slaughters, some of the greatest cases of ethnic cleansing and migration took place in our century. You know, tens of millions of people, but we don't talk too much about it. It's not on our radar in a way. Uh, and why that is? Well, we live in Europe and America is has its own outlook. But whatever the reason, you can take another example. How many of you know anything about Nagorno-Karabakh? Okay. Well, it's, um, it's within the boundaries of Azerbaijan. It's a region that's, I believe, inhabited or occupied, depending on your terminology, by Armenians. Right. But it's surrounded by it's, Azerbaijan. Oh, it's constant. It's in... It's a physical area going back to the settlement after the First World War of an area settled by Armenians. It's no longer settled by Armenians. Uh, as of four months ago, they expelled about 100,000 people. Uh, over time, we they think about a half a million Armenians were displaced and several hundred thousand Azeris. And I bring these things up because it's very difficult to distinguish between ethnic cleansing for nationalist reasons and political reasons. So the Armenians are Armenian Christians and the Azeris are Shiite Muslims, but <clears throat> primarily, yeah. But, in, but my, my point is, that for whatever reason, the world picks certain issues to focus on. And we haven't focused much about, in the most recently, as of September of last year, uh, there were the, uh, the last of the, almost the last of the Armenians were driven out. Well, let's go back to Islam to figure out how it fits into our patterns here. Muhammad in the seventh century is considered as the last, uh, final prophet, the last of the prophets. You know, we talked a good bit about prophets in the Old Testament. And uh, there is actually a, a statement in somewhere in the Talmud, the age of prophecy is over. Well, uh, as far as the uh, Muslims are concerned, it lasted another seven centuries until we get to Muhammad as the final prophet. Uh, he's a... a Muhammad's a general, by the way. I mean, that the spread of Islam is a military conquest initially. Uh, and the results are, let's look at these uh, Islamic states around the world. I don't know if you realize, the largest Islamic state is Indonesia, followed by uh, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. And remember, Pakistan and, and Bangladesh were one country from 1947 to the early 1970s. But for various reasons, in what I'm going to talk about, we're going to focus on the Middle East, on the Arab world. It's just too much of a topic to cover in, in, in the short time we have. And I'm not sure that it is uh, held together by any, any, any uh, common thread. But anyway, in the Arab world, the largest of the uh, uh, Muslim states is Egypt, 90 million people. About 90% of the population is Muslim. Once again, there's a 10% Christian population. We'll mention that there's, a, there's an issue there. Uh, Saudi Arabia, because it receives so much po uh, publicity, I threw in the population here. Uh, and here is another map 
some version of the other of the first map, the regional distribution of Muslims. You see a huge number in the Asian Pacific, but Muslims in the Middle East and North Africa, we see over 300 million people, and Sub-Saharan Africa. We don't see much in our newspapers about Islam in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's a major item. And I, my own prediction is that Nigeria uh, is heading for big problems with the Islam-Christian clash. Uh, but as I say, I'm not going to deal with all that. Islam, oh yeah, yeah. Peter, maybe you just flip the middle light switch. Is that better or worse? Uh, Islam is a lifestyle. So, I mean, it's not just a matter of praying five times a day, and, but it's a matter of how you look at the world, how you deal with other people. Uh, although it is split into two major groups, the Sunnis, who are most Muslims, and the Shiites, uh, and we'll see in a minute, there's no such, there, even within Shiite stuff, there are many different groups. Just as you can say, if, if uh, Christianity is divided into Catholics and Protestants, the Protestants are not a unified group. There are many, many of them. There are four countries, one, two, three, four, five countries who have labeled themselves Islamic republics, whatever that may mean. Uh, Afghanistan, we're familiar with because we see in the papers. Iran, we're familiar with. We don't know much about Mauritania, about Gambia, the Gambia, or uh, Pakistan. Pakistan comes in and out of the papers. Like there's an election going on now in Pakistan. And so all of a sudden you get a lot of coverage. But everybody, you know, you may have a, a group in Pakistan called the uh, Islamic League, but it's not Islamic politics because everybody else is also Islam. Uh, once again, uh, I'm just giving you this background. And uh, I don't expect you to memorize that list. I haven't, certainly. But uh, it's the official state religion in 22 states. And most of them, as you see, are in the Middle East. Uh, you know, North Africa is Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. Uh, we have uh, a little further east, you know, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and so on. Uh, that's, it's a surprise. We don't always see these in the Western world. And in the United States, yes? I was just wondering uh, how many of Sufi Muslims there are and where there are four countries that have mainly Shiites. Uh, Azerbaijan, Iran, uh, I can't recall, I won't get to the other two, but it's, I, I'd say maybe 80% of Muslims are Sunni, but the Shiites are concentrated in certain countries. Iran, Iran, Iraq, Azerbaijan, and one other are the Sunni centers. Yes. Where is Mauritania? Way over here, if you can see my cursor, on the west coast of Africa. Uh, and it's interesting that Mauritania is involved with a claim over land that Morocco and Algeria claim. So now Israel's gotten involved by recognizing Moroccan claims. So that's part of this international conflict. Yes, Barbara. What is the religion? What is the religion in Iraq? Iraq is about it's it, it, it's mainly Muslim, but it's uh, about sixty percent Shiite. But the ruling government is often Sunni. And I just mentioned U.S. Nation of Islam. Uh, I'm not clear how that fits into American politics, uh, because. You know, Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X used to get the headlines. We don't see much anymore. However, oops, uh, should go back if I can. 
it's becoming an issue now with the U.S. support of Israel that in Michigan, you have a very large Arab American community, which is very upset over government uh, policies. And that's a Shiite community, by the way, even though uh, Gaza is a Sunni community. Sunni Islam has no central religious authority. That's the, the uh, picture I showed before of the Hajj in Mecca, where uh, every Muslim is called upon, if he can, to make a pilgrimage at once in one's life to Mecca. And those that do, I've forgotten the term, you have a special term, a person who has made the pilgrimage. A Haji? No. Haji. All right, we have two people who knew that, one here and one coming across on the... The Sunnis are the, the unified kind of by Sharia law. Sharia is a set of laws, we'll see in a, in a second. They have four major schools of jurisprudence. That is to say, there's they don't necessarily agree with one another. Uh, but I just wanted to show you that in Saudi Arabia, which we always it gets a real bad press in the United States, and so this is this image on top of women uh, completely clothed, but if you look in black with just their eyes slit open. Uh, but this is also an image from Saudi Arabia. So it's not as though Islam is a unified single thing. Uh, here's Iran, which has its own hijab, the, the uh, the headscarf. So what is Sharia? You know, and it deals with human acts that say you can be, it's obligatory, it's permitted, it's discouraged or forbidden, various things. This is so similar to Jewish law uh, in, in its religion. It's, it's very similar. And if you look on the right here, uh, the components of Sharia the largest part are rituals of worship. And the next largest part are personal, family, and economic laws. That is to say, it's got marriage, divorce, uh, death in the family. This is a really a major part of uh, Sharia. And going back to uh, Israel, it has its own imposition of religious law on top of a civil law area. And those laws are often marriage, divorce, death, and so on. But, you know, sh Sharia gets thrown around, especially by congressmen, while oh, they're trying to impose this out of the other orders. Uh, and the sources of the law, the Quran, which the holy book that, that by tradition God has dictated to Muhammad. By the way, you can't translate the Quran officially, because these are the words of God, and God in this sense speaks Arabic. You can have a, uh, not a version, but a, a, a helping book in other languages. In addition to the uh, Quran, you have uh, Hadith sayings of the Prophet, you have actions of the Prophet, practices that were prevailing over time. That is to say, these things grow up over time, like any religion or any way of life. You have uh, customs that become part of your ritual, and, and you think they are eternal, when in fact, they're not. One of the things that Islam shares with other religions is a tremendous uh, distrust and suspicion of women. Uh, they, don't, they don't admit that, but it is there. It's also there in Orthodox Judaism. Now, I'm not going to go over this whole list, but I thought you'd be interested to see what a uh, an Islamic website says. What are the things that are really important? You know, no alcohol, no nightclubs, no pork, you know, male staff, etc. And if you look on the left, the five pillars of Islam really are faith in God, 
and Muhammad is his prophet. Prayer, fasting during Ramadan, one month a year during the daytime. Almsgiving, the Muslim community is a very charitable community. They give, as far as I can tell, a much larger percentage of their income to charity than what uh, we're used to in our society. And finally, the Hajj, if they can do it, the pilgrimage. And then all these other things that come in, you know, gender segregated prayer rooms. Uh, and then these things I didn't know about. Beds not to be placed in the direction of Mecca. Mm -hmm. Toilets not to face Mecca. You know, they, these are things that this al mullah hospitality corporate culture, that's what they've come up with. But what does it mean to, if you apply Sharia? And this is where it becomes political. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, you know, and in Iran, you have a public enforcement of morality. We read about especially dress codes for women. You don't read about dress codes for men, but dress codes for women. And then, it, then they have other things. The shops have to close at prayer time. Uh, charity, as I say, is to be collected. But here's a, an interesting miniature from the 18th century Ottoman Empire where an unhappy wife complains to a local official about her husband's impotence. So this is the Sharia talking about family matters. Uh, uh, it's amazing how reminiscent this is of traditions both in Islam and in Judaism. So for example, we talked about uh, the prophet Samuel, there's a whole big deal over uh, a, a woman who couldn't give birth until finally God intervenes. So that's what this uh, thing reminded me of. In Qatar, which is now in the newspapers a lot because of its uh, diplomatic activity, there's a mixture of Sharia and civil law. So Sharia is family law, inheritance, certain items, uh, and actually, in but in court, for example, a female's testimony is equal to that half of that of a man. And Islamic polygyny, that is to say, more than one wife. So you have, here's a guy with his four wives, and the next one, people are not happy about it. Uh, it's just something that's, you know, in our society, it just isn't done. I don't know if you can see this, but should Sharia apply to both Muslims and non-Muslims? Because here's a political issue. Uh, and if you go, I'm not going to go country by country, but let's just take uh, some examples from each one. For example, this is a survey among Muslims. What is your feeling? So let's say Kosovo. It's where they say 31% of the Muslims feel Sharia should apply to everyone. And 58% say, no, it's only for Muslims. Uh, so in Southern Europe, we see Islam is more moderate in this regard. If you look down at the bottom, the Middle East and North Africa, where 74% of those polled say that Sharia needs to apply to everybody, not just to Muslims. Uh, and even in North Africa, you see the changes from Egypt to Morocco, Morocco being a much more, in this sense, a much more tolerant society. 29% say that uh, Sharia should apply to everyone, and 60% say no, uh, just to Muslims. So this is, as you see, Muslim is not uniform. The, the feelings, the political and social feelings are not uniform. And I throw this in because we talk about it a lot. The, uh, the rights and responsibilities of women are equal to those of men, but they are not necessarily identical. And in, this is a, a, and it's a Muslim notion. This difference is understandable because men and women are different in their physiological, I'm not going to argue about that, and psychological makeup. <clears throat> what do, what, <clears throat> what restrictions on clothing? 
Uh, I thought this would be interesting. The Burqa on the left, that's Af Afghanistan, it completely covered with just sort of a, a lattice work in front of your eyes. Uh, the niqab in, uh, you see that in Saudi Arabia in, in very, uh, very conservative communities. It has an opening for the eyes. Uh, the hijab is a, a kind of a scarf. And we're familiar with that from uh, from Turkey, uh, also in Iran to a certain point. But the chador is a complete body covering. That's Iran and Afghanistan. So, what do the staff upstairs? Yeah. Uh, it's similar to a chador. That is, the whole body is covered, but the face is clear. Uh, when you see women in politics, they generally have hijab, that is, a headscarf. That's a characteristic. Yes. Um, just from working with American Muslim women, especially women in the African American community, they have a lot of creativity. They play with this. So we should look at our staff as, you know, young people experimenting with fashion. It's it's an American kind of thing, in my opinion, just from knowing young Muslim women. Let me summarize those two comments for the people on Zoom. The first comment was. Uh, how do you characterize the clothing that some of the people working in our uh, dining room wear? And uh, Marianne is, is commenting that in American Islam, there's a whole variety of ways that women deal with uh, dress codes. Creatively. Creatively, okay. Is the original, is the original hijab supposed to show no hair at all? The hijab, I think the hijab is supposed to show just the face and oval and without hair. And then, you know, it gets changed in different places. And that, that, the question for Zoom was, what does the hijab show? Uh, and the, we think the, you know, very, just though the very conservative societies. And it's Islam, but, you know, Islam is different in other places. Uh, and then I just, this is a defense of uh, uh, mis, uh, Islamic spokesman. Images of Muslim women as ignorant, oppressed, and submissive or stereotypical. They do no justice to the large number of Muslim women whose conviction in the Islamic concepts of family cohesiveness, happiness, and individuality ensure their sense of self-fulfillment. Well, may be true. Uh, it depends on what your point of view is. Again, the parallels to the extreme Orthodox Jewish community are striking. That is, there are women in these communities that say, yeah, what we have is the correct way. And then other women and pe people on the outside uh, don't like it. Yeah, Joan. It seems like it might all go back to the thing that they don't trust, that the women are not trusted. Yeah, Jane, uh, Joan is commenting that this all is based on the notion that women are not trusted. Yes, there is a suspicion of women. I, I, there's no question in my mind. Uh, I just wanted to throw this out. This is a recent prize-winning book in France. It's a translated in English now called The Impatient. Uh, it, when you read the book, it's about polygamy. And you have several African women bemoaning their lot as wives of men with multiple wives. And what's the answer? Be patient. Things will improve. Uh, I recommend the book a lot. Uh, it, it, as I say, the translation is The Impatient. In French, it's The Impatient Ones uh, by a woman who's from uh, Cameroon, I think. If I might just make a recommendation here, there's a wonderful uh, music video made by a woman whose name I think is Mona Haidari. She lives in, she's from Detroit, um, uh, from the Arab community there. It's called Wrap My Hijab. And it shows uh, a, a marvelous variety of styles to do it. And I think you could probably find it by searching for Wrap My Hijab on, uh, on the internet. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Chava. I don't know if that comes across on the recording, but it was uh, the comment that there is a video called Rak My Hijab about Muslims, women in America. So we should move on here. Uh, I just, going back to Judaism, there is so many, there are so many parallels here uh, with Islam uh, and women, again, in Judaism, it's from the Bible, the oral law, and from custom, you know, matrilineal descent, that is, uh, Jews are defined by who your mother is, that goes back to a period of uh, who would inherit land. Uh, initially, men were the people who determined it. Later on, it was uh, women. But in traditional Orthodox Judaism, women are seen as distracting to men. Uh, very Orthodox women wear wigs when they get married, when they shave their heads. Uh, and as, actually, as Marianne was pointing out, then we become various kinds of strategies to be attractive anyway. Uh, this is uh, in Israel. Daughter of Israel, that's what the wall thing says. The Torah commands you to dress modestly. Uh, you know, we're running late here, but uh, women are discouraged from all these characteristics that men have, and they pray separately. I say often behind a screen, not necessarily a screen, but traditionally there's a uh, a decent sized wall between the men and, and the women in the prayer areas. Uh, and now there's this uh, movement to ordain women. The Aguda, remember, that's this very right wing organization, very religious. And uh, they consider this to be outside the basic tenets of Judaism. Okay, we're going to go on. I just want to point out here, Palestinian women at an Israeli crossing point, and they too are segregated by sex. They're self-segregated here. Well, what's going on in political Islam? There is a idea of returning to the golden age of Islam, whatever that was. Let me move this down here. Uh, and the Salafis, this is a school of jurisprudence. The, here, the, this is very important for politics. And, and you see some of it in Saudi Arabia. They say Muslims must not rebel against their rulers, should be rulers. And they don't really don't get involved in politics in this notion. Uh, then there are the activist ones who want to reshape society. And we'll talk about that probably next week in Egypt and Tunisia. Really, you've heard of the Arab Spring. We'll, we'll talk about that. And then finally, there are the jihadis. He said, you go to war. And we're familiar with uh, the Soviets being driven out of Afghanistan, with Al-Qaeda, and ISIS. We'll talk some more about ISIS as the latest manifestation of the holy war notion. And I just threw in these uh, images. Al-Azhar in Cairo for a long time was considered the major source of Islamic learning. Uh, that's a traditional intellectual center. It has declined in importance uh, I think under political stress, that's why I mentioned it here, that other countries saying uh, these guys are fuddy-duddies, they don't understand change. Uh, it's still important, but there are competitors. And this is just as an image, King Mohammed VI of Morocco. Remember we, when I looked, showed you those few attitudes in Morocco, they were much more moderate in terms of how Sharia should be applied. Uh, it's a, it doesn't say that it's a dem necessarily democratic country. I mean, there are people who have written books saying that the uh, king and his family, a bunch of uh, uh, crooks uh, in it for personal gain, may be true, maybe not, but it is a calmer society, more open to other groups. All right. You've heard the term Shiite or Shia Islam, where the prophet 
is appointed by God alone. And God, according to them, chose Ali to be Muhammad's successor as the first caliph. Well, there were people who did not agree. And in fact, he got assassinated. But the people, this is uh, in the city of Kufa in Iraq. It's the site of Ali's assassination. You have several holy cities in Iraq, holy for the Shiites. And this is one. The prophet or the successor is infallible. This is going to be important when we talk about Iran. Uh, there were 11 imams. Where is the 12th? Uh, or the Mahdi, as he's called. In certain Shia's belief, he is around. He's in hiding, or as they say, in occultation. Uh, for Sunnis, the future Mahdi has not arrived, but the Shiites, I'll give you an example, one of the subsections of Shiism are the Twelvers, because Twelfth Imam. There are other groups of Shiites, but uh, again, as I mentioned, it's not just a unified whole. But the Imam is a spiritual successor to Muhammad, and according to the Shiites, there's always one Imam of the age. And he is, you know, in, in terms of Iran, it's the Ayatollah is the Imam of the age. But the estimates vary from 10 to 20 percent of all Muslims. Someone asked about this. But in the Middle East, they are concentrated, close to 40 percent of all Muslims in, as I mentioned, Iran, Iraq, Azerbaijan, and I didn't mention Lebanon before. Uh, in order to deal with political Islam, we probably have to take some countries individually. And we'll do that. But here is, uh, again, someone asked about the percentage of Shiites. So Iran, 90% Shiite. Iraq, 55 to 65%. Azerbaijan, 45 to 55%. The other countries have a much lower percentage, you know, like, as I say, Pakistan, India. Don't forget that India has several hundred million Muslims in its population. You think the prime minister of India wants to tell you it's a Hindu nation. And in fact, that would be a whole other course. What about religious conflict in India? I just maybe in the future. Can't deal with that now. Uh, whoops. Where this is. The Shia is a majority of Arab Muslims in many American cities, and Detroit is an example. And I say, what are the political implications? The Democrats are very concerned about that for the next presidential election because Muslims have been... Uh, starting to feel that instead of being just passive, you have to combat Islamophobia uh, and you know, defend your community and vote. And one of the ways you do it is vote. So that's it's out there. What is a caliph? A caliph is a successor to Muhammad, leader of the Muslim world. Remember I said that the, uh, the Shiites are looking for the 12th Imam. It's kind of a caliph, but the Sunnis uh, have a, a different issue. There was the problem of a successor to Muhammad. Uh, presumably the election of the caliph was based on knowledge of religious and worldly affairs, but in fact, it was how would you were related to Muhammad. Uh, Ali was his cousin, I think, that didn't help save him from being assassinated. You have the first four caliphs who are what are called the rightly guided caliphs. And you'll see in a second why I'm talking about this. Because what happens is Muslim Islam expands very rapidly. Look at that. Muhammad died, uh, was it 632, perhaps? I'm not sure of the year now. Uh, but here's the Umayyad Caliphate, 
It's over the whole Middle East. This is uh, 50 years after Muhammad's death. It, tremendously successful in spreading its control, not, not as though every person becomes a Muslim immediately, but they are politically in control and they have geographic expansion by conquest. Uh, the Shia support Ali and his descendants for control, and the Sunni have competing colleagues. Things change. And at one point, in, for a couple of centuries, the caliph was a Shiite, but that ended. It was in Egypt. The largest Shia communities, Iran, Iraq, Azerbaijan, and Bahrain. There are some people who say, I'm just a Muslim. They don't say I'm a Sunni or a Shiite, but I, I, I suspect that they're Sunnis. Uh, but that's, that's a, a kind of a comment that you would think would come out of the uh, United States. I, I'm just a Christian, I'm just a Jew, whatever. I'm not interested in that political conflict. The Ottoman Empire, you have the, the sultans stressing their leadership of the Islamic community. So that, remember, Ottoman Empire, Turkey, spreads all over the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, I should say 1876, he didn't live for 11 centuries. Uh, Sultan uh, Abdul Hamid II, he was both a secular ruler and a religious ruler. I mean, the other colleagues were too, but this is very, uh, it's crucial for the development of Turkey because in 1908, there's a revolt of the young Turks, and they initially strip the caliph of his secular authority. They're not, they're not successful immediately when they go back and forth, but here's the caliphate at the time of the First World War. Uh, here's uh, what's now Turkey right there into Iraq and this long strip of Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, you're familiar with the legend of T.E. Lawrence. He's the one who supposedly is leading the uh, Arabs down here, Muslims, to political conquest. And this is an image of Sultan Abdul Hamid II receiving his orders to abdicate in 1909. And then in 1924, after the First World War, you have a significant war in Turkey over, for control, and the caliphate is ab uh, abolished. Uh, I think of this, uh, that war also, you think of the, uh, once again, of Gaza, how Gaza has occupied our attention. We don't pay much attention to Greece and Turkey at the end of the First World War. Terrible suffering. Uh, probably a million Turks or more, uh, Greeks, are expelled from Turkey. And hundreds of thousands of Turks are expelled from Greece with a lot of suffering, a lot of killing. Uh, so these kinds of conflicts are not new in our society. Uh, and somehow we get fixated on certain ones. We mentioned, I mentioned ISIS. You've heard, presumably heard of ISIS, Daesh, whatever uh, it stands for. In the Middle East, it is an Islamic movement that says it wishes to impose its rule on everyone. And it will be led by a, a caliph. Now the caliph al-Baghdadi was killed in 2019. ISIS is still there. And it's a combination of a religious movement with social unrest, as a lot of religious movements go. So uh, it's now out there in the uh, Iran-Iraq hinterland. There's a, a similar movement in Nigeria uh, looking for Islamic control. And they want a caliph because that's how you control the society. And at one point, 
they were dominant over that very large territory here of uh, in Iraq and Syria uh, and in Libya. The Shiites don't want a caliph, but they have an ayatollah, which is an honorific title for high-ranking clergy. Uh, and the ayatollah became very, as a term, became popular in the 20th century. Uh, and so now we have the ayatollah Khomeini, died in 1989. He was a very successful political leader in the guise of a religious leader. The two things went together. Uh, and he saw the Western colonial powers having a design, a conspiracy to subjugate all Muslims in all spheres. And by doing this, they threatened to destroy the very essence of Islam, whatever that essence is. That's another item. But here are uh, two images of uh, the one on top of uh, how many in, in 1976 in the holy city of Najaf? And here is uh, here he is getting off the plane in Iran in 1979. Remember, uh, the Shah was overthrown, and you have a, Iran has not settled down yet. Here's a comment from. Uh, I think it's from Khomeini. If the ruler is not knowledgeable about Islamic legal affairs, he's not fit to rule. For if he would just follow a jurist, his authority will be wrecked. And if he doesn't follow a jurist, he cannot enforce Islamic law. That is, Islamic law has to be imposed, and that's a political statement. Uh, but he goes on to say that they have many enemies, not just corrupt rulers like the Shah, but their masters, the U.S., Britain, the Jews, the Christian missionaries, the Freemasons, the Baha'i. The Baha'i, you may be familiar, a secret religion is really persecuted in, in Iran now. And his condemnation of the Jews was conflated by identifying them with Zionists. And he says the Zionists want to control the world. The Islamic movement from the outset encountered the Jews and they were the first to spread anti-Islamic propaganda and to hatch intellectual conspiracies. That's this notion. So it's, <clears throat> it's not just in opposition to Israel, but Israel does stand for, in his ideology, the Jews. Whoops. I this is the Arab Spring in 2011. How does all of this come out in politics? You've, I'm sure you've all seen the term the Arab, Arab Spring, but what does it mean? In 2011, a, a street vendor set himself afire in uh, Tunisia as a protest against uh, his inability to make a living. And it really became a widespread revolt against uh, an Islamic government. And you have people say, we want an Islamic democracy in Tunisia. Uh, it hasn't been entirely successful, but it's been uh, quite a breath of fresh air in a period of control of North Africa by some very repressive governments. In Turkey, uh, and we'll talk about some of these countries uh, individually next time, political Islam is emerging as a real political force. You know, it, in Turkey under Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey, was a rigidly secular society. Under President Erdogan in the 21st century, you have increasing first freedoms for Islamic activities and then uh, imposition of certain Islamic activities. Here you have Islamic Muslim scholars in Istanbul. And you can just by looking at their, uh, their dress, you see it's a combination 
of traditional Western dress with uh, a traditional Islamic scholarly dress like here, or uh, <coughs> I don't want to call them hats, but what do you mean to call them headgear that are traditional. And so we have ISIS, we have Islamic democracy in Tunisia, we have an emerging political Islam in Turkey, and we have ISIS. And I don't mention uh, uh, Nigeria, which has something similar to ISIS going on. And remember, Nigeria is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the uh, largest country in Africa, probably 200 million people. So it's a very serious item. And here is an image of soldiers, <coughs> excuse me, soldiers of ISIS. They are, you know, very serious about this. In Pakistan, you have uh, the image of Islam can rouse the crowds, even though everybody is a, a Muslim. If you recall uh, last year, the year before, a, a, a rebel rouser in uh, Sweden burned a Quran, and people in Pakistan just went crazy over that. But uh, uh, I want to go back uh, to uh, in Pakistan again. Remember that in 1947, when India becomes independent, it's the Muslim League under a man named Jinnah that demands a separate country, a separate place for Pakistan. You know, Gandhi was very upset over that notion of a separate country when he lost that battle. Uh, and Pakistan became, you know, if you recall, a country in two parts. In the, what's now Pakistan was West Pakistan, and then what is now Bangladesh was East Pakistan. Uh, and that was that came about uh, Indian connivance for getting uh, Bangladesh free. Although, you know, now you have an issue. Is a, a Bengali in Bangladesh is a Muslim. Now, is that the same thing as a Punjabi in, in, in uh, West Pakistan or a Pashtun? Remember that West, remember West Pakistan has a number of very uh, significant ethnic groups. So internally, the Muslim Brotherhood, which we'll talk about next week, may say that Islam is the answer, but everybody's got a different answer. You know, it, it's, uh, and there really are very uh, significant differences. This is, I'm gonna end with this, if I can just get this thing to move. The Arab Spring is an attempt to have democracy as more or less as we know it in the West. Uh, and there's an, uh, a map of Tunisia being a relatively small country compared to Algeria or Libya. And uh, it's an image of, here you say, here it demonstrates, Tunisia first, Egypt second, Libya third. That is, they're looking for the overthrow of the government whether that's Arab democracy or another kind of government, we don't know, because it's very difficult to uh, to figure out what the uh, what democracy is. Uh, under Erdogan in Turkey, critics call it corroded democracy. Supporters call it uh, a moral imposition of certain aspects of Sharia. And it just depends where you're going. And probably going to end with this. Turkey is entrusted to you. And there are that's the image of Erdogan, who he's not the only person who's tried to fix elections. But that's uh these are next week we'll probably deal with some individual countries. Oops, what's that? That's what we'll talk with. I, I'm going to stop here because that's we're going to talk about the Arab Spring more and how Islam, I tried to give some background on what Islam is a religion and what some of these things 
uh, are involved with and how that it plays out. And we'll talk about, again, in the Middle East, we're going to talk about uh, uh, Gaza and Hamas and Lebanon and uh, Tunisia here, Morocco. So uh, we have a couple of minutes that we have comments or questions, either for in the room or from Zoom land. If you have a question in Zoom, and I guess you can uh, uh, unmute yourself. I don't know if you have anybody out there. Just one quick question on the Gaza Strip, if you remember. Uh, I remember years ago when the Gaza Strip was returned in, after the 67-year war. And I was impressed with the Gaza Strip because it was a big center for flower production. And the first things the Arabs did was knock down all the greenhouses. I was appalled at the time. Do you remember anything like that? Yeah, that, that happened. It's not that you don't have the right dates, but uh, when the Israelis pulled out of Gaza in the 21st century, there was a thriving flower export business that did very well. And there was so much anger about the Israelis that people destroyed everything. And there were some wonderful greenhouses. There was a very successful flower business. Uh, and it was a, a, a real shame. I mean, uh, I, you understand people's anger, but you would think that, they, that the authorities would have organized to protect that because they needed for their uh, just cutting off their nose despite their face, it was appalled. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you know Jules is a great is that our local flower expert, but uh, but he's right. This is not just being not just an interest uh, in flowers, but it's a whole industry which is very important. Any other uh, comments, Larry? Yes, Paul. Uh, when I lived in New York City in the 1970s, among my acquaintance uh, were a number of uh, young gay men, and, um, and they were being persecuted in the United States, and they fled to Morocco because Morocco had a liberal policy at the time permitting gay men to live and be and conduct themselves normally in, in the state. Uh, I don't yes. know if that's still the case, but that was true then. Yeah, I know I've heard of that in Morocco and it's come out in this tolerance for other groups in Morocco, it sets them off. So you can't say Islam does A, B or C. You have to say, how is Islam enforced in Morocco or Tunisia or Saudi Arabia? And, and that's really what I've, uh, I, I've spoken in generalities here, but I also try to point out national differences. And uh, in the, the second in this series, which will next week, we'll really look at how differently uh, Islam appears in the, in these different countries, in the politics of these countries. Remember that my focus has been on politics, not so much on belief, although I did a certain amount today to figure out. So because it's unfamiliar to us in the West. But okay, uh, I'm going to stop here. I thank you all for coming and for your participation. And uh, 